Today's teaching came to me through various confirmations and even though I will be speaking to his prophets, I will also be addressing everybody in general. There is something different to this teaching that I've not experienced before. I found myself afterwards very emotional from the afternoon to the next morning, even waking up during the course of the night with my heart just crushed. And I cannot explain it and I think it has to do with God's disposition towards his prophets. Maybe it's my disposition. But there is a sense of, this is holy, don't touch it. So I really pray that the Spirit will show and reveal that which only He can do. Father is not relenting from this course of addressing the leadership of the church and wants us to address the prophets today. So this is no small matter. He has not changed and never will. He's always used His true prophets to be His mouthpiece and to carry His burden to His people. If God is to restore all things, it stands to reason that he will restore the order of the prophets again in this last hour before the dreadful and terrible day of the Lord, as described in Malachi 4 and Revelation 6. So it behooves us to understand his ways, for his complaint against us is that his people do not know his ways and they do not know him. I was awoken one day from sleep in which Father started to give me a prophetic word about his true prophets, which I will share during the course of this teaching as well. Once again, even though I will address the prophets, the office of prophet, I am also addressing the body as a whole. I spoke to someone about two weeks ago regarding different types of prophets, more specifically how God uses them differently. I mentioned that I am as a Samuel who yield my sword with precision to not only expound on the word of God, but also by the spirit to cut and pierce into the heart. The sword of the spirit is a two-edged sword. If it's to cut, it will cut both ways. In other words, not only into the hearts of those listening, but it cuts into the heart of the one speaking as well. Let's read Acts 3. And we're going to start from verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abram, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. So from the get-go we are told that all things will be restored. It is by the mouth of prophets that God speaks his purposes, using them as a compass to direct his people in his ways. Prophets were essential in biblical times to be as a mouthpiece of God to the king ruling at the time. There was a high regard and fear of prophets. They had to hear from God about the course of action needed to take during war or other governmental decisions. This is also why King David feared the prophet Nathan who was revealed David's secret sin of adultery and murder. He knew that what Nathan spoke over his life would come to pass. And that would explain why there were not uh, so many prophets as opposed to today's myriads of prophets. Indeed, at this last hour, as he said, judgment begins with the house of God. God always starts with the leadership and works his way down. As the priests, so the people. Where our Jewish brothers and sisters have had the holy prophets of old up until John the Baptist, we as the church through the calling and gifts of the Spirit have our prophets that speak now his purposes to his Gentile bride. So the job description of prophets are found in Jeremiah 1, that's verse 9 and 10. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, 
to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. There's always a breaking down and uprooting before there is a building and a planting. Does this not stand to reason that this is exactly what will happen to the prophets if God is going to restore all things, which include the order of prophets? This is the underlining theme of this message. If God is going to judge, it is with the intention to restore. And so he will start not only with those who say they are apostles and are not, but with the prophets as well. For ultimately, in this dispensation we are now in, in Ephesians 1, tells us that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. This is true both of the Old Testament and the New Testament for apostles and prophets are foundation layers. They are master builders in the kingdom of God and they will be held accountable for the foundation they lay. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And the beginning of something says something about the end. In other words, the origin of something sets a standard. The birth of something and what happens during conception affects the end because it is the foundation. And if the foundation is firm and strong, the house built upon it will stand. The first prophet we read about in scripture is Samuel. In Psalm 99 verse 6 it reads, Moses and Aaron amongst his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name they called upon the Lord, and he answered them. Moses and Aaron are mentioned as those who called upon God, and God heard their prayers. But in the same breath, we read that Samuel is included amongst Moses and Aaron. And Moses represents the first apostle, which means a saint one, and we know he was sent by God to Pharaoh to demand the release of God's children. Aaron is the first priest, and Samuel is the first prophet. We know that first fruits denote God's divine blessing and it means to be set apart, consecrated unto him. This is to say that true apostles, true priests and true prophets belong not to man but to God. The first fruits belongs to God. So in the scripture we have true, we have an apostle, we have a priest and we have a prophet it is calling upon God and God hears. In fact, Samuel's name means God has heard and it's referring to his mother Hannah who pleaded for a son in the temple. Her prayers are in fact the conception of a prophet of note. Quoting our Arthur Matthews in his book Born for Battle, he says, Nothing of God's will is properly and effectively executed that is not first begun and then carried out through prayer. In other words, God has predetermined that Samuel would be a prophet, but if it was to be, it will be through the desperate prayers of his mother, whom God has set apart for this purpose. Not for one second do I think she ever stopped praying for her son. She consecrated her son unto the Lord. And just like you cannot separate the message from the prophet, because the two are one, so you cannot separate prayer from prophet, for ultimately, a prophet is a man or woman of prayer. It is their beginning and their end. Samuel was laying down in the temple of God where the ark of God was. This is the place of waiting on the word of God, which is the ark of God that constitute the law of God, the presence of God and his righteousness and holiness. It's in this place of waiting where his spoken word comes as an event in both the prophet and those who hear, for it will pierce. A prophet is a praying man and woman who knows how to wait on God in prayer. Prayer is not a means to an end, but the end in itself. Communion with God is not getting a word. It is by this union that the spoken word of God comes, but that union is in prayer. It's not just the source, it's the goal. It is to draw near to the living God and there, in that place, through a union brought about by devastation of a life brought low and to dust, 
where he hears the one who spoke the word world into existence. And there was light. In the Holy of Holies, there is no natural light as in the outer court, no light by the menorah as the inner court, but the glory of the Lord is the light that shines in the darkness of the Holy of Holies. And how dark is our heart unless his spoken word comes forth and lighten our darkness. It is there where we behold him as he is and we behold ourselves in the light of him. In 1 Samuel 3, the word tells us that the word of God was precious in that time. And this word precious means that it was rare, therefore considered as valuable. It refers to the prophetic utterance and visions coming from God. And in the same way today, we have much to say about God, many prophets, many self-proclaimed prophets. But how much of that is actually truly authentically God speaking? How much of that is actually God's word put into their mouth, as he told Jeremiah. We've all heard it. We've heard the doom and gloom. We've heard the exhortations and blessings. But we are not moved. Today, there's not a shortage of the word of God, but rather, it's difficult to discern the true from the plethora of words going out. And because of this, to find the true word is so rare, and in a sense, so much more valuable. On my walk the other day with Father, I said to him, Father, people do not fear you. And they do not fear your prophets. And there's simply no fear for the office and what it constitutes to be a prophet. After all, a prophet is a dime a dozen. If you do not like one, you can always choose from the myriad of others on the assembly line. We get to choose our prophets as if a prophet is there for, of man's choosing or will. When a person has many dreams and, uh, and visions... They are considered a prophet. When a person has a word of knowledge, they are considered a prophet. When a person predicts something right, they are a prophet. And amidst these plethora of prophets, there is a true remnant that he has set apart. Truly, the word of the Lord is rare in these days. In 2 Peter 1, we read about prophets. Let's start from verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The scripture is telling us that the prophecies of the Old Testament spoken through the holy prophets of old did not come because they willed it, but rather the Spirit came over them and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This was God speaking through them and not they interpreting it in order to present it. They were the oracles of God and had to bear the burden of God being held accountable for relaying his message to his people by the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit. An example of the Spirit coming over someone not by his will and private interpretation is Saul. Samuel tells Saul that he is to go to the plain of Tabor and there he will meet prophets. Let's read that. That's in 1 Samuel 10. And we're going to read from verse 5. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God. Note, it's at the hill of God. Where is the garrison of the Philistines? And it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Verse 9, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. 
And when they came hither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said to one another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? So Saul was not a prophet. But the point here is made that when the Spirit comes over a person, it is in fact a divine intervention or a taking over of the person to be used as God's mouthpiece, where the gift of prophecy and not the office is bestowed. Many today are operating under the gift of prophecy, like Saul, but are in fact not a prophet. And this is why they asked about his father, because they wanted to know under whose guidance Saul became a prophet, under which prophet did he learn. Hence, not having such a father, it became a proverb to say, is Saul also amongst the prophets, when God uses someone of low degree or insignificance. Now Saul was not yet made king, and just a young lad looking after his father's cattle. It's very important that we understand the difference between the gift and calling, uh, or the office, and that not all are actually in the office just because the Spirit moves them to prophecy. Or to prophesy. The point I'm making is that no prophecy is of man's will when the Spirit comes over a person. But note, verse 9 tells us that God gave Saul another heart. To understand this, we have to read the scripture in context. In the previous chapter, chapter 9, Saul and his servant is looking for his father's lost asses. They could not find them, and Saul was concerned about his father coming to look for them. They then decided to go to the prophet Samuel, known as a seer at that time, to inquire where the asses are. And in the meanwhile, the Lord told Samuel that he would show him who the first king over Israel would be. And when he saw Saul, the Lord revealed to him that this young man standing ahead above others will be the king. Is then asked to join Samuel for a meal that Samuel especially kept for this occasion, giving Saul the choice place at the table and the choice meat, which was a shoulder. And we know now that shoulder has to do with governance. So here we have a young man, quite ignorant of the call upon his life, suddenly being told that he would be the king of Israel. I would say that requires a change of heart. So no longer would the asses be his concern, but the whole of Israel. And so, with this knowledge and understanding of the responsibility upon his shoulders, God gave him another heart, that is to say, a heart for Israel, and was, he was turned into another man. Therefore, for the gift of prophecy to come upon a person, God deals with that person's heart first. If that is required just for the gift of prophecy, what then is required for the office of a prophet? What is required for us to rule and reign now and in the time to come? What does God do to prepare his true prophets and to make them his mouthpiece? For every office, God prepares his vessels and how he works in all of them differs. Ultimately, they are all accountable for what they do, being shepherds of his flock. But when it comes to the prophet, God requires much more. If people truly understood this, they would not be so quick to say that they are, are a prophet or want to be one. In fact, they would run the other way. When a true prophet speaks, the honor of God, whether God is heard, is of utmost importance. Is God being heard? And with what hearing do we listen? Do we sit back, arms folded, a skeptic eyebrow lifted and smirk on our face, saying, let's see what this one has to produce? The consequences of many false prophets out there is that it also shaped the ears and heart of those who are to adhere to the true spoken word. With what ear do you hear what I have to say? In time of great deception, 
it's of utmost importance that we are able to discern between the true and false. But did you know that discernment is a matter of the heart and not just cold heart facts alone in Scripture? For just as much as God has to deal with his mouthpiece to be able to speak through them, so he has to deal with the heart of those who hear. And just as we speak from the abundance of the heart, so we hear and so we see. All the issues of life flows from the heart, and out of all things we are to God the most. It's our heart. Think of the Garden of Eden representing a heart from which the four rivers flowed. Those four rivers in the garden were the source of the garden and its state. If the rivers were to be polluted, then it would be seen in the fruit. Consider then the fact that we are his garden and that what flows out of the rivers of our heart will affect all of our life. Yeshua said that the pure in heart shall see God. This is not just a statement of seeing him with our bare eyes one day, but it's prophetic seeing as well. Preconceived ideas, emotional baggage and traditions all form part of the filters through which we perceive or discern. It's not just enough to know the word. Someone can speak the truth, but the spirit of the speaking can be false. Someone can address certain issues, but themselves be out of line. How are you to truly know unless you yourself ask God to give you another heart? That includes a heart for true prophets just as much as you have a heart to discern the false prophets. And while we're on the subject, nobody is perfect. Prophets are held at a much higher standard and also placed within the public eye to be under their scrutiny and watchful eye. But make no mistake, God will even allow a prophet to err in his life to be a means to test you with regard to your heart. Just think of Elijah after his showdown with the Baal prophets on Mount Carmel, running away and hiding in fear in the cave from Jezebel. What do you suppose those who knew Elijah thought of Elijah hiding away in fear? What do you think they might have said? Very often, Without us knowing it, others' faults and sins are there to test us and show us the true condition of our heart, where we would much rather prefer to call them out. As was the case with Moses, we find his brother and sister, think brothers and sisters within the body, criticizing Moses. Miriam, his sister, was talking to their brother Aaron, gossiping, and they both came to the conclusion that God speaks to them as well and not to Moses only. And by the way, what's up with marrying an Ethiopian woman that is against the law? So God, missing nothing and knowing their hearts, tell them the following in Numbers 12 from verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Have the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses or by Moses? Have he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him Will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches? And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. That he departed is quite a statement. 
so as if he turned his back on them. Note, God did indeed speak to them as well, and Moses was guilty of marrying an Ethiopian woman, but that was not the issue. God was searching their hearts. Now, the moment God departed, Miriam became leprous and had to stay out of the camp for seven days. Note, Aaron did not get leprosy. We have to understand the significance of their role or their type and shadow. Moses represents apostleship. Miriam, scripture tells us, was a prophetess. And Aaron represents priesthood. So we have apostle, prophet and priest together again, just like Psalm 99 verse 6. And the reason Miriam was struck with leprosy is because she was the first to speak. Hence the reason she was mentioned first. This envy was therefore conceived first within her heart and her mouth testified it and defiled Aaron who did not watch over his heart. In Hebrews 12 we read that we are to pursue peace with all men and holiness without which nobody will see God. And then it continues to tell us to guard against bitter envy. For the root of bitterness defiles many. What does this tell us about her heart towards Moses? She was envious and rebellious and she was not a false prophet. What does this tell us then about the true prophets of God, which is what Miriam was and how they speak against his true servants? This tells us that not only are there presently those hearers who have no fear of God, and do not fear his true prophets, but that there are also true prophets who have lost their fear of God and are willing to slay the servants of God within a moment's notice, just like Miriam. It's in fact possible to become so comfortable in their call to speak of God's judgment on the wicked and the false prophets and pastors that their hearing and seeing are no longer as clear as it used to be because they do not diligently watch over their heart. And so what comes out of their mouth is mockery or a disdain that is void of God's true intent. It may sound like God, but is it? Does this mean that everything that comes from their mouth has to sound kind and loving? Not at all, for even the tone of their speaking is to be subject to the spirit and the heart of God for that given situation and word. So in speaking so much judgment, it's easy to grow callous of heart. The flip side to this is that there are prophets who are so soft-spoken, showing their fear of man and what man can do. Either extreme is not of God, for ultimately it's not our own view or opinion that matters, neither that of any man, but his heart, his view, and his speaking. Who is sufficient for this unless we allow the Lord to continually give us another heart, that is to say, his heart? Speaking against God's servants is no small thing and in great jealousy for the truth many a true prophet or teacher has been slain. Vicious and cruel things are said without one prayer having gone up for them. We have to remember that there are those who are deceived but their aim is not to deceive and there is a difference. Yes, God will hold all accountable but we are not the discerners of hearts. He is. In Jeremiah 17 verse 9 and 8, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. In, con in contrast to Miriam and Aaron, we find Samuel asleep in the temple and hearing God calling him. Let's read this account to learn from the first prophet Samuel's example. That's in 1 Samuel 3 and we're going to start from verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place. And his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, 
And he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli, and he said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a, a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice, no offering for ever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide every, anything from me of all the things that he hath said unto thee. And Samuel told him every whit, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Taking into account Miriam and Aaron's disposition towards Moses, we find Samuel's disposition towards Eli completely different. Remember, this is a similar situation. The leader, be it apostle, prophet or priest, is in question and there's a vast difference in how Samuel relates to Eli. His immediate answer is, here am I, speaking to Eli. This is a boy who lived with Eli and was aware of Eli's compromise. He knew about Eli's sons and how he was unable to control them. He knew about the promiscuity and fornication. He saw all these things and yet submission and respect is heard coming from his mouth. He was immediately available to Eli, even if he did not know that it was actually God calling him. He was serving Eli in spite of knowing everything about him. God is indeed looking for those prophets who are willing to serve before they judge. Samuel respected the office and knew that Eli as priest stood before God. It even says that he ran to Eli, not begrudgingly, not moaning or thinking about the late hour, no huff or puff, not thinking, what can this old man with his dim eyesight have to say? After all, I am of a new generation who do things differently. He is irrelevant. No, he ran to the man of God. Not only that, he was called a few times. Most of us cannot handle being woken up a few times at night. But when your heart is to serve, you will do so without grumbling. Your mouth is always the thermometer of your heart. What disposition was in Samuel? What kind of heart did he have? It was that of our master, our priest and prophet, who did not come to be served, but to serve. A very different disposition, which is actually reflected in the fact that he was a 
child. It was to a child that this precious word came and it was given as a word of judgment. Can you see the prerequisite? What does this say about the words of judgment that comes from his true prophets other than that it has to be preceded with a disposition of a child, still showing respect and honor to his priest and prophet whose eyes have grown dim? God first works in the prophet before that word is to be spoken. Is this disposition of honoring those whom he has called not an expression of God, of his mercy and his love towards them whose eyes have grown dim? God takes no pleasure in the judgment or in the judgment that was to come upon the house of Shiloh. This childlike disposition must be found in his servants, especially his prophets, not only in what they speak or what they know, but especially in what they are. Before they are prophets, they are servants. Samuel's response was, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Paul says the following in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. Let's start there. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. We know that actions speak louder than words. Humility, the fear of God and a childlike disposition is the foundation of the words Paul spoke. Therefore, when he spoke, it became first a demonstration of the Spirit. What is that demonstration? It is nothing other than that it is not to be his words, but the words of God given to him, and therefore in itself an expression and demonstration, not of the man speaking, but God himself. It was then that it has also become a demonstration of power. A demonstration of who the Spirit of God is. For ultimately, the prophet's responsibility and call is to express the heart of God. Therefore, a new heart is required. And if he is doing a new thing with the prophets, that is to express his heart in the time to come, he will undoubtedly deal with their hearts. For out of the abundance of our heart we speak. It's in the waiting upon God in prayer, laying before the ark of God where this disposition of a child is formed in us and we then hear our name to run with him. The character and the life of the man is the foundation of this word spoken given by God. It's therefore spoken in the spirit of truth, which is the sword of God. A word spoken in truth and in spirit comes as one that is unadulterated and piercing. It is virginal as a child. This is why we read that the 144,000 being without guile who follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes in Revelation 14 are virgins, meaning they have not fornicated with this world. Philip is a type and shadow of the Church of Philadelphia representing the 144,000 who receives an open door before them that nobody can close. That's in Revelation 3. So in Acts 21, we read about Philip being one of the seven chosen to serve the church and he represents one of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 to 3 being the Church of Philadelphia. Only two churches did not get a negative report amongst the seven churches in Revelation 2-3. And this is the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. They are both evangelists, fishers of men. They also represent the two fishers where the boy came with the five loaves and the two fishers to feed the multitudes. 
Let's read that in Acts 21, verse 8 and 9. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So Philip has four virgin daughters who were all prophets. Once again, this shows us that the disposition of being childlike, therefore virginal, cannot be separated from his true prophets, just like Samuel. This is seen not just in what the prophets speak, but how they live, who they are. Samuel said to God, Lord, speak for your servant heareth. Samuel was ready to hear. God had his ear because he had his heart. No filters of bitterness, disappointment in Eli, shame or anger. Before we can speak, we have to be able to hear and see as he does. It is the pure in heart that will see God. He was ready to hear. How many times do we not hear a true word from God because we are too busy to judge the vessel? And because of certain filters in our heart, we do not hear as we should. God has to deal with our hearts, especially concerning the times we will be going in where many more false prophets will rise. There is an absoluteness of obedience required of the prophet, which asks of him not to withhold anything. And so Samuel told Eli everything. He withheld nothing from him. And in the same way, Paul says that he did not withhold anything, but told the church the whole counsel of God. It will cost you, just as it costed Paul to speak the whole counsel of God in the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. You may win some, but you will undoubtedly lose many. A few years back, Father said to me the following. He said, being my mouthpiece means that you answer to me alone, to stand before me alone and answer for what you say and do. This means you do not consider what man will say or how man will respond. Their response is not your focus, but your obedience unto me. Not whether man approves, but whether I approve. How do we know that Samuel's true test was not in how he responded to God first, but how he responded to Eli first? How do we know that this was not the test that qualified him to be God's oracle, by how he served Eli, the man whose eyes grew dim. We are to remain as a child until he speaks. It might matters not how impressive you sound, it matters who you are. We think the Lord draws a distinction between how we serve him and how we serve others, but this is not so. How you serve the worst, not condoning their evil deeds, but how you serve them is the testimony of your understanding of how he came to serve the worst. You. This is the testimony of the character of Yeshua, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. Make no mistake that this is that which the enemy despises with a venomous hatred that laid at the heart of the stoning of the prophets. Innocence, being virginal and childlike, is the expression of the child Jesus, whom Herod in his envy caused children up to two years to be slaughtered. This is the spirit of this age where our children are the main focus. It's the slaying of the innocent. And whilst we are in an uproar about the many pronouns, what really is happening is the murder of innocence in our land. We fight pronouns when we should be fighting against principalities, powers and wickedness in the air. We see this not only in abortions, child trafficking, drugs and prostitution, but amongst his true prophets and teachers. Remaining guileless and free of the root of bitterness is key in order to discern rightly. The same spirit operates through those who envy his true prophets and servants and are eager to stone those who exhibit the testimony of Jesus, not just by what they say or teach, but who they are. They are slain between the porch and the altar. Men hate them because they hate their message. They are their message, just as Yeshua is the word. And if they cannot reject the word, they will reject the man. Satan despises the true prophets of God for this very reason and seek those well-meaning vessels 
that do not guard their heart to come against them. How will we discern rightfully unless the childlike, this childlike and servant heart of God is given to us? We have to enter into a place of waiting and seeing just like Samuel. We can speak the truth, but that truth cannot be mixed with guile. Not long ago, Father gave me a quick vision. I saw someone pouring different ingredients into a container, mixing it, and then pouring it into another container that was transparent. The whole scene was playing out in a lab. The contents changed into a green color and started to bubble. Soon it overflowed the rim of the container. The Spirit then said to me, Once I have your mouth, I have you. This is something Father said to me years ago. So the container is our heart. And whatever is poured into it together flows out of our mouth. To have our mouth is to have our heart. And it's also the reason why in James we read that the tongue is able to control the whole body. The green color speaks of envy, a form of guile. And guile is a tricky thing. It is the most subtle sin. And to be innocent of guile is to be as a child. Its greatest hiding place is within the temple. It disguises itself as righteous indignation, zeal, and even love. It has the appearance of purity and virtue, whilst at the same time, within the folds of the veil of your heart, it hides envy, hypocrisy, and bitterness. And it does this not in excess, but just enough for you not to notice it. It makes me think of a YouTube short I saw the other day. A woman was painting herself completely black from head to toe in order to play a prank on her husband. And that night he came to sit at his computer and she, hidden in the dark in front of black curtains, could not be seen. Of course she scared him stiff, but I'm sure you get my point. She was there, but he was not able to see her. This is how guile operates. In transparency, I want to share a quick dream as well that I receive from Father and whatever happens in my life always holds hands with what he wants to say to his children. So someone who has turned against me talks behind my back, criticizes me, calls me names and uses me spitefully and is truly hypocritical for the past 14 years has stepped up his game lately. This is nothing new and this relationship has been this way for years. And within this week, I've seen a greater attack in these areas and without me being aware of it, I carried unforgiveness in my heart. Father then gave me a dream about a friend that I used to know. If I had to describe this friend of mine, it would be the word bitterness. I'm not being judgmental. She and I often spoke about this. So I was in her house and she was very angry with me. In this dream, she threw herself on me and started to speak bitter words to me. Her face was very close to mine as she threw clenched teeth and in great anger told me what she thought of me. As I walked out of her house, I slammed the door with all my might. Of course, this drove her even madder. What was Father saying? The spirit of bitterness is harassing you and you had better slam the door on it which I promptly did, obeying scripture that tells us to humble ourselves before the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So I forgave this person wholeheartedly and lifted him up again to the Father. Having said that, we can never stop watching over our hearts. Satan must have nothing in us. The enemy is walking and prowling around as a lion to see who there is that he can devour. Some of you may not be outspoken over false prophets and teachers, but that has not stopped you to speak out against your husband at home or your boss at work. What about your pastor? They are the Eli's at home whose eyes have grown dim. The Eli's at our church or those whose teachings we are used to listen to, where God still requires of us to honor them, We have written them off in a moment's notice because we just do not gel with them anymore. You may be keeping quiet, but hide within your heart a bitterness that is so subtle, unaware that it has taken root in your heart. All you have to do is to pay attention with what comes out of your mouth when the heat is on. Error steps in when even truth is spoken with guile.
You can give your two cents in a situation, but be unaware of the guile in your heart. The division within our homes is not just that of difference of opinion, but a difference of disposition. And opposite, opposite spirit working as seen between Eli and Samuel. Eli, warned by God to set his sons in order, does so not as to move them to repentance. It is said that Eli himself was overweight because of his compromise, and a curse came upon him and his children. What does this say about Eli and about the Elis, the men and women of God in our lives? They no longer fear God. They're rebellious and compromising. They have no control over their children, be that within a home or church. Two spirits within our temple or in one home. The one is called to serve the other in humility, so that when that word comes, the judgment spoken by God can come through a mouth without guile and pierce to the dividing of bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and discern the intents and motive of the heart. The reality still remains, though. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision of all the words of judgment to Eli. And just like Jeremiah saying to God, I'm a child, I cannot speak. No matter how long you have served the Lord, when the moment comes to speak that word given, that same disposition that was in Samuel and Paul is in the prophet, which is in fear and trembling. Not of man, but to go against God. As Samuel's ministry started in trembling, so his life continues in trembling. Whatever strength and valor is exhibited is by the Spirit, for it is not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. And I can testify that I find myself often trembling before the Lord as one whose strength has left me, a miserable piece of flesh desperately crying out to God to enlarge my heart and to work through me. I asked him, this will ever change. And his answer was, no. He said, do not fear what will be. I know that this, this is overwhelming and that you know that in yourself you cannot do this. This is good, for it is I that have worked this disposition in you so that you may depend on me with your whole being. We are told that we will know a tree by its fruit. This has not changed. And we are to call out false doctrine or deception when we see it. However, we are to know the difference between those who are deceived and those who deliberately want to deceive. It's a whole different story when someone has been confronted in love. We are to speak the truth in love and we are to go with another as a witness to speak that truth and to help as the body when a member of that body is deceived. We are to be long-suffering as he is with us. The aim is not to expose, but to deliver. We expose the deceivers, yes, and their works of darkness. Somehow, we have thrown the deceived and the deceivers into the same camp. The one is a sheep gone astray, where the other is a wolf who devours. A lot of scripture can be used to support our actions, but in the last analysis, it matters greatly to God with what heart we speak and whether what we speak is actually of him and for that appointed time. We correct error with a shepherd's heart, with a staff, before we take out the rod of correction. The staff is curved at the end and was used to hook the sheep and pull the sheep out of a ditch. The rod is used to swing over the shepherd's head, making a loud noise to chase the wolves away. We are to know when we are to use a staff or a rod. When that person chooses not to change and there is a clear sense of hardness of heart and unwillingness to repent after a time, it is then that we know that they are given over to a reprobate mind, deceiving many. All this is to be done under the guidance of the Spirit and in His timing, not ours. However, not all who are deceived are false prophets or false teachers. This is why we can hear at times profound teachings or revelations coming from them and at other times, we are astounded by the deception they believe. This does not make deception okay in any form, but does require of us to know Father's heart towards them, who alone knows their heart and when to confront, when to keep silent, and when to move on. God 
does not make cookie cutter prophets. They are diverse as the teachers out there. Some are called to be as a hammer and others are as Samuel who was quite proficient with his sword. God's word is both a hammer and a sword and in order for his prophets to speak as his mouthpiece, whether a blessing or judgment, he first judges them. They themselves need another heart. They need his heart. David prayed in Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. A pure, a, the purity of heart is imperative, but so is a right spirit. This word right refers to being established. Think of putting a pole upright into the ground. It's set and it is upright and it does not move. It does not mean the right spirit in contrast to a wrong spirit, but it means an established spirit, one that is fixed and endures. It speaks of faithfulness and to be firm. In fact, it reflects Saul's new heart he was given where he previously was concerned about his father's asses, now to be fully focused, committed and established to set his heart on being Israel's king. He had a change of heart. So it speaks more of a disposition than the condition of his heart. The words create in me a clean heart, O God, refer to the condition of his heart, where having a right spirit speaks of the disposition of his heart. Both are necessary for the servants of God, a clean heart and a right spirit. What is in our heart governs our life. And oh, how we need another heart in this day and age, even those who have walked with the Lord for many years. I'm also talking about those who are sure of their call and how he wants to use them. You know, with my speaking, Father is directly addressing in me to seek him for this right or established heart, this right spirit in what he is showing me with regard to his fair maiden's ministry. It matters with what heart we hear or see. It matters with what heart we teach and it matters with what heart we prophesy and serve. It's not only a matter of doctrine. And if we do not have his heart in a given situation, we can be right yet wrong. We can say the right thing but have the wrong spirit. That is to say mocking, judgmental and critical and being callous. We can also be flippant, having no fear of God and dismissing those whom we think deserve nothing but his judgment, all the while his heart is breaking. If we are to have another heart, it's to be his heart, because ours is desperately wicked. It is with this same heart that we analyze and weigh the word of God spoken. And who can blame us when we see the disgrace and contempt poured out towards false prophets. Who do we trust? To whom can we go? Is it not better to just ignore the whole lot altogether? Does this constitute clasping our hands over our ears and saying, I hear nothing, when God is in fact speaking at times? We find ourselves in quite the conundrum, if you think about it. To one extreme we are called to discern, and in the other to listen by faith. The problem lies when we do this by leaning on our own understanding whether scriptural or what we feel is right or wrong. From out of the mire of false prophets, God will raise and restore his order again when his true prophets will stand up and speak as the oracles of God with the signs and miracles and wonders to follow. God will not be mocked and will also not take it lightly when his true prophets are mocked. If only we understood the severity of God and just how serious a matter this is, we would tremble at the thought of speaking against those whom he has anointed. This is not to elevate prophets above another office, but it's important to understand the investment God makes to form such a vessel of his to be his mouthpiece. The responsibility, authority and therefore accountability is enormous. The deaths they die is not required of the other officers with the exception of true apostles. The prophet is given a scroll to eat and on that scroll is written lamentations, mournings and woes. He is to take it into his belly. That is to say it has to become part of his very being. Father does this by allowing the prophet to experience that which he is to speak so that when the prophet speaks... The spirit of truth is in it. 
He is the message as well. It's then that it is a word that pierces because that word is truth. Not just the word itself, but the vessel itself. This is not required of the other officers, but it does not mean God will not work this in them as well either. Office of prophet is not more important. It just is what it is. Here's a quote from Arthur Cutts. He's my mentor. He says, God has a deep identification with that which is prophetic. And for someone to touch that is to touch him. To abuse that is to abuse him. May well be that the greatest enmity against God is visited upon the prophets for exactly that reason. To assault a prophet is to assault God. How shall I say that without making it sound self-serving or personal? I know that it's true. There's something that the world hates and the world hates God. The world is at enmity with God. But the prophet, he is the visible manifestation of elements central to God's own being that the world has the opportunity both to identify, hate, to despise and to do evil. The testimony of a prophet is a statement of God, not only when he is speaking, often when he is silent. Their presence is an abomination and an offense to a world that despises God. You cannot separate the ministry from the man. He is a message himself. The man himself, the investment of God, the shaping of the character and the life is more pronounced than other callings with the exception of the apostle. What the man is, is an offense as well as his message. If he's not the message, you may expect that what you have is not a prophet, but a false prophet. When we discern from a heart that is filled with hate, guile and envy, however subtle, we will find ourselves on the wrong side of the fence thinking we are for God when we are in direct opposition to him. For when you speak against his true prophets, his servants, you are speaking against him. In a subtle way, when we judge or discern from such a heart, without us knowing it, we scrutinize every little thing and feel justified when you have found a flaw to then speak against against them not only are we feeling justified but it also serves in building up the self-esteem in in the stance taken without us knowing it when we judge from such a heart seeing the flaws in others god is searching our heart that person we are judging is god's means to expose our heart humility is key in 1 samuel 3 you read that the lamp in the temp- temple went out. That's, let's read from verse 2 and 3. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out into, in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. It's not interesting how in almost one breath is mentioned that Eli's eyes began to wax dim. And that he could no longer see and at the same time the lamp of God went out in the temple. We know that we are the temple of God and that David says in Psalm 119 that his word is a lamp unto our feet and it is a light unto our path. Eli's eyes dimming and the lamp going out is no mere words of coincidence but in fact describing the present state of the church in its lukewarmness, the Laodicean church. Let's read Revelations 3, um, verse 17 to 19. Because thou sayest, I am rich. He's speaking to the Laodicean church. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knoweth not that thou art wretched, miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Is it not true now that many profess they can see, but are in fact blind? The seeing affects everything. Because if they could indeed see as they say it, they would know that they are naked and in fact not rich at all. We understand this is a direct result of the lukewarmness that the church finds itself in because 
compromise dims our eyesight, as was the case with Eli. Eli's sons were fornicating at the door of the sanctuary, and God describes them as sons of Belial. They were serving within the temple or the church, and Eli was unable to reprimand and correct his sons. This is an example of the sickness of our age where the fear of man is greater than the fear of God. As the priests, so the people. I woke up this morning at 5.03 and in the Strong's it means Ikabot. And obviously this is not a coincidence. What is Father saying to us? Ikabot means the glory has departed. And Ikabot was the name of the son of Phineas, who was Eli's son who died in battle. And Ikabot was spoken over this church, over the house of Shiloh. The son of his son is now called Ichabod. Generations are affected by compromise. But note, Eli also represents a church system and age, the lukewarm church, Laodicea, which is the church age we are now presently in. We have children in this wicked generation who do not even know who they themselves are, let alone who God is. People no longer fear God and therefore no longer fear his true prophets. And in this state, the church's eyes have grown dim and they do not see the purpose of God nor understand the hour. Scripture says in Isaiah 42, Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant. The Pharisees are often called blind guides. Think of Saul, a man called of God before the foundation of this world, but blind. And yet God had to strike him with blindness, baptizing him in weakness, dependent on Christians whom he once persecuted, sent him into a wilderness alone for a period of time, thus preparing him before he could use him as Paul. He had to change his heart. Eli was not a false prophet or priest. He was still the man of God ordained, but he was living in error and therefore blind. I received a dream from Father on Thursday. I've not completed this teaching as yet and knew that he wanted me to include it. But before I share this dream with you, it's important for some context first. Often our relationship with people in a dream is the underlining message and not the people themselves. Approximately 20 years ago, I had a very close friend. We both served the Lord and were involved in a counseling ministry. The direction of the ministry changed to that of life coaching, and soon the focus became no longer ministry, but business. This caused me to eventually move away from what used to be a ministry to a business, as I was not interested in it at all. So having said that, my friend and a mother, who is the head coach of this business now, loves the Lord dearly. They really do. I know this personally because of how close we were. My friend's mother was closer to me than my own mother at that time. So, um, she saw me as a daughter and she would introduce me as a daughter to others. Whatever she bought her own daughter, she bought me as well. I had free access to their home and was truly her daughter in every sense of the word. So having given this context to you, you will understand the interpretation even better. In this dream, I'm going over to their home. And when I got there, my friend's mother is sitting on the couch and she's laying with her head on her mother's shoulder. I went to sit on the other side, laying my head on her other shoulder. And soon all three of us were fast asleep. When I woke up, I saw that my leg was over her legs and I was holding tight unto her while still laying with my head on her shoulder. She wakes up and walks towards the kitchen saying, I see you had a good rest. I say, of course, I was resting my head on my mother's shoulder. I have a deep love for her in the stream. I noticed that my friend is no longer there. I then turned to pick up a small case that had my glasses in. The strange thing is that it was electronic and it opened very slowly. I was impatient and forced it open. I noticed the glasses looked different than my normal ones and when I, when I put them on, it was very dirty. I could only make out dimly what was before me and I tried to clean the glasses but to no avail. I then realized 
that I actually have my glasses that my husband Daniel have given me. These glasses are the brand Police and once I put them on I could see very clearly. Okay, so this is the interpretation of this dream. My friend's mother represents the Holy Spirit as a mother because we are born by the Spirit and we very often uh, experience the Holy Spirit's ministry to us as a mother. We are both her children that love her dearly, in other words, the Spirit dearly. As mentioned before, a shoulder represents government or authority. Scripture tells us that the government of the kingdom will rest upon Yeshua's shoulders. So government or authority rests on shoulders. Shoulders also speak of strength. So both our heads are resting on our shoulders. Remember, they serve as a type and shadow in the dream. Our head also speaks of authority, to be the head of something or to be like Saul, a head above others. It also speaks of our mind and having the mind of Christ, knowing the authority given unto us and resting on that. We are resting and resting speaks of living by faith, but it also speaks about ruling and reigning. When I wake up, I am holding on tightly to her mother, representing holding tightly onto the spirit. However, my friend is gone. She's left, speaking of leaving her post in a way. I look for my friend, but I cannot find her. I then take this electronic case for my glasses and become impatient with how long it opens and I force it open. Glasses speak of discernment, the ability to see. And my impatience is a problem because I'm therefore not waiting on God, but prematurely open the case and put the glasses on. This is the same as those who are quick to judge because they clearly see a problem but are not willing to wait on him. The result is that they still see dimly. As the glasses I put on, I could not clean and everything was vague. In 1 Corinthians 13, we are told that we only know in part and we only see dimly as though through a glass. But when the perfect has come, we will know even as he knows us. So the timing will determine whether you see dimly or rightfully discern as you should. I then put my husband Daniel's glasses on that he bought me. Now these are police glasses which he gave me a while back which father at that time confirmed to me that he will show me the plans and the schemes of the enemy. Police investigate which points to discernment and glasses points to seeing. Daniel speaks of being prophetic and so it means to discern prophetically that which will happen now and during the end times. The point is, my husband also points to my heavenly husband, Yeshua, who alone sees everything before whom all stand naked. He knows all things and sees all things and we, in contrast, know only in part. He wants us to see as he sees and put on his glasses. How does this relate to what we are talking about? The focus is the two daughters who have one mother, the Spirit of God. And even though the one is no longer holding on as tight as she should and cannot be found, it does not mean she's not her daughter anymore. Just like the prodigal son was not no longer the father's son in the parable. He may have eaten some pods along the way and squandered his inheritance, but ultimately the father's heart was broken. And how many of those we come against, leaning not on the shoulder of the spirit anymore, but on their own understanding, seeing dimly, are actually sons and daughters whom the father mourns over. And in the name of truth, we take hammer or sword and expose what they say or do, but not necessarily by the guidance and leading of the Spirit. In our impatience, we force it and cause harm to the unity within the body. Once again, this is not to say that we are to allow deception to rule and reign, but to help us understand that we are not to be like bulls in a china shop and let rip just because we see it. Our first aim must be to deliver such a one and that in prayer. How can you speak a judgment over someone you have not prayed for? Is he not seeking intercessors who will stand in the gap to stay his judgment according to Isaiah 59? 
We do not know how Father will use them for His glory. We do not know His plan for them and He has not given us full disclosure as to what He will do. We are to be governed by the Spirit of God, leaning our head on the shoulder of God, knowing that all authority belongs to Him and what is delegated to us must be governed by the Spirit. As long as we see from man's point of view, our seeing is impaired. I would like to share a word I received from Father in 2021 called Discipline. At the heart of this word is his desire that we who are fathers and mothers in the faith, shepherds of his flock, will still remain as children ourselves, to remember that we are all of one household. At that time I had a quick vision of children in a lounge playing. Some of the children were jumping on the furniture and others playing with forks and just being undisciplined. It was then that the Spirit gave me this word. This is in the 30th of October, 2021. The word's called discipline. In my household, you will find children of different natures and dispositions. Children more yielding, that are eager to please. Children seeking to make their mark. Children who are spoiled and lazy and children mature and responsible. All these form part of my household all part of the family of God, all named by me. I love them all dearly. However, every situation requires certain actions and wisdom. I know how to deal with every child where they are at, what will draw them to me, what will cause them to be humbled, what will stretch them and cause them to grow, what will cause them to be sons whom I can trust. Such is the household of God but all loved by me. I will never leave them nor forsake them. Just as the prodigal son in my parable got up and left because of the lust within his heart and still being drawn to this world, I never forsook him in the parable, but patiently waited for his return whilst loving my other son at home. The one I longed that he would return whilst the other grew in sonship, both my sons. However, In this time you are in, it calls for seasons of change. And if my children do not discern the seasons, they will miss what it is that I'm going or doing in them. Therefore, this discipline will become more severe as they think it's still time to play. Lovingly, I will rebuke in my love, but if they refuse, I will discipline them that they may return. And truly, The discipline may seem severe, but the season calls for focus and maturity. Continually, they miss the forest for the tree. I am long-suffering. I will not relent in drawing them unto me, even if it is through suffering. If only they would come to me and not lean on their own understanding. They are ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I search the heart of man, and yet they search not their own hearts. Rather, they call on me to save them, when it is I that is disciplining them. And so it continues. Blind to the issues of their heart, they lament their turmoil. Is my discipline then not my love? Will I relent the love needed in this season which is my discipline? They refuse to turn to me but desire that I would return to them. They refuse to humble themselves and to search their heart. Shall I humble myself and come to them? Surely not. The discipline will increase. When you hear that, does that not just show his heart towards the prodigals? How he longs for the deceived to come back to him and how eager he is to restore them. They're still his children no matter how far they've gone. Coming back to Eli, he also represents the spirit of this age over the church and the old order of prophets who compromise with this world, singing to the tune of the people in order to tickle the ears as well. And Samuel represents the new, being young, 
just a child. And God is raising up a prophetic remnant of his choosing. You will remember in the last teaching, raising the standard, I was talking about Malachi 4, where Elijah must come first, and that he will turn the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. And these fathers are not only the fathers of a household, but they also represent the prophets. This is why the prophets who heard Saul prophesy asked who his father was when he prophesied. They wanted to know under which prophet he learned. Also the king of Israel called Elisha father in 2 Kings 13. So the prophets are known as the fathers of the nation or mothers like Deborah. This will give you context to this word father gave me when he woke me up from sleep on the 25th of February this year. It's called restoring the order. There is a time coming where once again they will fear my prophets as they did the prophets of old. As it was then, so it will be again. Again, I will speak to my prophets, those whom I raised up, who lay on their bed to see what I am to speak to them as Samuel did. They will speak as my oracles, carrying my burden upon them before my people. As it was in those days, fire will come to burn up the idols man have created and worshipped. For I have always used my holy ones to set the standard and to raise the banner of my holiness. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that I am Lord. I will send them into the midst of this crooked and wicked generation, and many will know that I am in the midst of them. For surely I tell you, Elijah must come before the Son of Man comes in his glory. Know then that they will not be of man's choosing, but a holy remnant set apart by me and unto me. They will cause my fear to fall upon the land and once again restore the order of prophets in this generation. The place of seeing is in his presence before the ark of God. God told Miriam and Aaron that, Mos that with Moses he speaks face to face. Moses brings much to remembrance in his very significant role he played in scripture, but one of the most profound is that he spent seven days in God's presence up in Mount Sinai. Make no mistake that that number seven is by no mere coincidence, as it means completion. What had to be completed in that time period? It says in scripture that on the seventh day, Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. That means that at the end of day six, the number of man, Moses, had to come to the end of himself, for no flesh can stand before God and live. Something of a death had to transpire in Moses for him to receive from God his plan and purposes for Israel. Is it not interesting as well that just as the Israelites who feared God not out of awe and respect asked Moses to pray to God on their behalf, not willing to pay the price and be with him up in that mountain. So also at the Last Supper, the disciples asked John the Beloved to ask Yeshua who it was that would betray him. They knew that John had Yeshua's ear. God had Samuel's ear and his heart. Yeshua had John's ear and heart, and therefore he could speak. You see, there are many people who love the Lord and long to be close to him, but very few willing to pay the price of going up the mountain and what it does to you and to meet him at that place. And going up the mountain is the process of sanctification. Um, you can visit our uh, tabernacle page on our website where I go into depth concerning going up the mountain. This is indeed what transpires within the life of his true prophets. It's a death in all categories because ultimately there cannot be two wills or desires competing in any form within the vessel he will use as his mouthpiece. If he or she is to speak, then it has to be unadulterated and pure, flowing from a heart, beating as one with his. I want to read from a clip of one of David Wilkinson's teachings called A Holy Remnant. I was amazed when hearing this as it confirmed what Father has been showing me in this teaching and also in the direction he's taking his fair maidens in. Father has been speaking to me very clearly about raising up prayer warriors, an army with banners. It's by no mere coincidence that I came upon this clip. I took the liberty to only note down 
parts of it, but you can listen to the whole clip found in the description box. Before I read this, please understand and listen with prophetic ears because ultimately he is not only speaking of prophets like Samuel, but a priesthood. And this priesthood is the army of the Lord, the workers that will be sent out during the tribulation to bring in the great harvest. This is what David Wilkerson said. God is doing something very hidden. It's very quiet, but it's so awesome and supernatural. It's beyond human comprehension. In fact, what the Lord is doing right now is going to affect the whole world in these last days. He's preparing a very small but most powerful army of dedicated Christians. This army that God is raising up is going to be the most dedicated army on the face of the earth. Never before anyone as pure, devoted, fearless as this remnant is coming forth. They are going to come forth and do exploits. They will shake hell literally. This new army is going to be made of handmaidens of the Lord. It's going to be made up of servants of the Lord. Ordinary Christians who lay hold of God and God lays hold of them. A whole new realm of service, a whole new realm of the moving of the Holy Spirit is about to break forth. He is going to raise up a Samuel company, hallelujah, the holy remnant. It is the judgment of God on an old religious system and the raising up of a whole new program with the Holy Spirit. It's all about the death of the old church, the religious religious system and the birthing of a new holy remnant. I want you to keep in mind what God did in Samuel's day. He keeps doing in every generation and every generation when so-called church, the organized church backslides, it gets cold and compromising. God just gives up on it and raises up another. He has always had a people. He has always had a people after his heart. He has always had a praying people in every generation. They are called the remnants, remnants through all the ages. There is always a remnant. But oh, this remnant, remnant that is coming is going to be beyond anything the world has seen. Samuel looks at Eli and says, Behold, the day is coming. I'm going to cut off your arm. I will cut off your arm. God is saying he will quit this house of Shiloh. I will remove my presence and I will make it powerless. I'm going I'm giving up on Shiloh. I'm giving it up and I'm going to give it over to the hands of the enemy. This is exactly what is happening in America and the world today. The organized religious system has been turned over to the enemy. Whilst the church of Eli was under judgment and being forsaken by the glory of the Lord, God was busy raising up a remnant. Samuel represents the holy remnant. This is what he is doing right now. He is training many of you to do his works in the last days. The remnant is always birthed in prayer and intercession always. Hannah birthed Samuel to bitter tears and much prayer. If you are going to see God with all your heart, all your soul and strength, you will feel the pain and grief of God for his church. You will suffer consequences. You will be misunderstood on all sides. People will accuse you of all kinds of things. God is hearing the prayer of a people in his house, a people who yearn for the outpouring of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, a people who yearn for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon their sons and daughters, a people who want to see the glory of the Lord come down on his church, a people who want to see God move in very special ways in these last days. God is going to hear their cry. These are people who really are on their face seeking him pouring their heart out to God they were people that were given according to Hannah given just like Samuel to the Lord all the days of their life they are wholly given to the heart of God do you know that Samuel was such a man of prayer? All the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not. There's going to be a praying remnant where people will not go for counseling but for prayer. God wants to raise up prayer warriors who touched 
heaven. The training of the remnant is going to be trained to know the voice of the Lord. God is raising up an army of people who know his voice, who hear from him directly. There is going to be a holy remnant that is going to be steadfast and sure, unmovable. God will put divine principles in your soul and fire you up and get you off the fence. Get up and seek his face and deal with sin in your heart. Get into this book, the Bible. Get alone with God. Let him speak to you. God says, I will raise them up and anoint them. I will send them forth to do exploits in my name. I will lay hold upon you and I will anoint you. I will open doors for you. I will stir your heart and you will know me. You will know my voice. I will use you to glorify my name. You will never have a name. I will be glorified through your lips and your heart. You will not be recognized, but I. I will recognize you and on that day I will reward you because you were faithful to the call. Volunteer your soul, body, spirit and mind. Cry out to the Lord and say, here I am, send me. We have to understand that the church, specifically his workers, are called to be an apostolic and prophetic entity in these last days, to confront the forces of darkness in delegated authority that is birthed in the prayer closet. It is in prayer where he meets us in sanctification and then the glory comes. Just as Solomon first had to finish the temple before the glory of the Lord filled it. It's a holy remnant he is raising through whom he will do great exploits. To be that apostolic and prophetic entity against the enemy, not just in the office but as normal Christians, we have to be willing to meet him up the mountain for those six days to then receive the word to be spoken on the seventh day. We have to be willing to set the time aside and pray, pray, pray. We have to put first things first again and place priority on that which is God's priority. He is seeking those who mean business. If you will draw near to him, he will draw near unto you. Let's pray. Father, every person that has listened to this word will be held accountable, including me speaking it. Father, how many prophets and teachers have we slain in our self-righteousness? You do not want us to be quiet over deception, but you always focus on the heart first, our own heart, before we can speak. Forgive us, Father, and show us those servants we have spoken against and thereby spoken against you. Cleanse our heart and renew a right spirit within us. I ask, Father, arrest us, body, soul and spirit, to seek you like never before to mean business, to set time aside, to make first things first again, to cry out and pray. For if you are to move, you will do it through prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for doing this new thing in us and for restoring the order of your prophets and your servants. Amen. <music>